everyone. Welcome to our newest episode of There Are Four Hosts. As always, there are four hosts. Um, I'm Sabrina. You can find me at Cat Gaming on Twitch, Twitter, or Instagram. And I'm Michael. You can find me at Blue Beetle Games on Twitter. I'm Jonathan. You can find me at Just Average J pretty much everywhere on the internet and socials. I'm Keith Justice. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Keith Hayward. And it is my genuine honor to introduce... Melinda Snodgrass, oh my god, uh, thank you for joining us on the podcast. <laughs> thank you so much for asking me. I'm really excited. Um, it's so nice to get to talk about the things we love with friends, especially when we're all social distancing. So there thank stuff. you for including Absolutely. Absolutely. Before we start, is there anything right now that you're geeking out about a lot? This is Keith's question, by the way. Yes. <laughs> Any show that you love right now that's really got your attention, a book you're reading? Um, I'm loving Westworld. Um, I think yes. Jonah is doing an amazing job with it. Um, and, uh, and I'm loving the Clone Wars. I watched yeah. the latest episode. <laughs> oh, so dark, so heartbreaking. Oh, so, so, um, so, oh, um, and, and then periodically just to make myself happy, I go and rewatch episodes of Rebels that, that have Agent Callus in them. So, nice. um, so that's, that's what I'm doing. I, I was awesome. heart. Heartbroken that the magicians ended their run. I loved that ah, show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, I just want to um, yeah. lean in and give you a fist bump on that Clone Wars and Rebels stuff there. And did you uh, <laughs> hear the news that every Clone Wars fan is going, "Oh my god, oh my god!" About where uh, that incredible duel at the end of that last episode was motion captured with Ray Park. No, I didn't oh, know that, wow. but it was wonderful. So nope. yeah. that's exciting. Maybe I have to watch the show now. Oh um, we will talk a lot about Star Wars at the end of this. Um, <laughs> but first, let's cover some basics about writing. Jay, you had a couple of writing questions? Well, yeah. So um, basically, I, I, I'm one of those people that um, just since we have a writer on the show, um, I was like, who better to ask, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, I'm one of those people that's kind of a dreamer but it's hard for me to put pen to paper you know if that makes sense so um mm -hmm. like how does someone who is a professional writer actually get over blocks or get over the the initial um getting it out terror yeah yeah <laughs> the, the absolute the initial terror, terror. Yeah. yeah yeah like yeah. it's it's really um, um you know as someone who has issues um just putting pen to paper and getting ideas out um it's it just i've always wondered like how how does a professional you know, go about it and just, just get that idea out there to become this amazing thing. <laughs> well, for me, um, my friend George Martin and I debate this constantly. Um, he calls himself a gardener, which is another way of saying a pantser. Yep. And <laughs> he says, I'm an architect and I am an architect. Um, I outline. And so when I get a notion, I, I get an idea, as you said, a dream that's, and I think, oh, that's a cool story. The first thing I try to figure out is what is the end? What is the mm -hmm. ending of that book? And mm -hmm. if I can't figure that out, I put it aside because clearly it hasn't cooked enough. Mm -hmm. If I can see what it's going to be, and usually it comes up because characters occur to me and a situation and I wonder how they got in that situation. And then I wonder, okay, but how do I resolve it? And so I always start at the back, at, at the end of the project. And that is also how we work in Hollywood. But you know, I can talk more about that too. So the first thing I do when I'm outlining on a whiteboard or pr preferably using three by five cards on a cork board, nice. I lay out the acts. I have a teaser and generally three acts or four, four acts. And then I go to the end of act four and I write down how this ends. What is the end of this story? And then I go and figure out what the teaser is, the thing that makes somebody pick it up off the shelf and say, I would rather buy this book than a six pack of beer, as Robert <laughs> Heinlein used to say, and, uh, and figure that out. And then I figure out what the end of the rest of the acts are. Because if you know where you're going, it's very mm -hmm. easy to figure out the steps you need to get there. Sure. And so I think the mistake is that people start at the beginning and it just looks like this huge mountain they have to climb whoa and um uh -huh. and this huge mountain is feels very intimidating and if you can break it up into discrete moments scenes acts uh -huh. aiming towards something it it starts to feel a lot less daunting um and so that's my general advice is is figure out a, a roadmap for yourself 
and know that you don't have to drive across country in one sitting. You know, this mm-hmm. is a it's it's a marathon, not a sprint. You know, <laughs> it's amazing. Plan your pit Th- yeah. stops. Thank you. That's a, that's amazing. I it just it's so cool to like have someone who does it just be able to answer that question. So thank you so much. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> I love right. to, I teach I teach a lot of writing courses. So. Oh, well, um, I, I love hearing it. about the process of writing so much. So yeah, I'm just like cheesing over here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, let me come at, cut in with a question about that. How do you deal with uh, kind of uh, the uh, influx of imposter syndrome? Unless that's the thing that doesn't happen to you. Oh, it happens to me. Um, it, yeah. it always happens to me in the in the beginning. Um, mm-hmm. You know how a dog will circle their bed before they lie down? It's like, I don't know. Is that... That's what I do before I have to start a new project. I wander around my office and I circle the chair in terror and I gaze mm-hmm. at the computer balefully, balefully and go, oh, I balefully. hate you. Yeah, And I'm like, uh, because that oh, that first blank page, and I know in my heart that this is the book or this is the screenplay that will absolutely prove I have no talent. <laughs> and I've been faking it the entire time. Right. And then mercifully, I usually have a contract. And also I, I was trained as a lawyer, so I have this sort uh-huh. of must do the work kind of thing that they drilled oh, into good. me. That helps. It helps. So I go, well, there's nothing for it. If I'm exp- exposed, I'm exposed. I just have to sit down. And if I can get that first sentence out, even just that much, mm-hmm. I, I feel okay. Mm-hmm. But I got to tell you that blank page and that terror that I feel is very yeah. real. Um, and I, I think if you ever lose that, then you're not trying to get better with every project. Cool. And that's yeah. always a danger for writers. I, I think you have to say there's always something more to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, writing is a hobby of mine, but I personally was trained as an actor and a similar thing. Like if you're not anxious before scene, if you're not afraid of it, then like, are you really, <laughs> Are you really putting yourself 100% in that situation? Yeah, um, totally. Uh, especially with writing, because you have to do a lot of investigation into yourself to get the kind of like the feelings or the, the themes across to other people, right? Yes. I mean, Harlan Ellison used to say that um, if you don't want people to see your soul, don't write. <laughs> don't write, um, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I mean, because he said you're going to, you know, I mean, he... Harlan went a little overboard, but he was like, you're going to rip open your veins and bleed on the page. And I don't know if that's <laughs> absolutely necessary, but you certainly give things away that yeah. you aren't even aware of. I Years ago, I was interviewed by a gentleman from the Canadian Broadcasting System, and he said to me, everything you write is about fathers and sons. And I went, no, it's not. What a, Oh, my God, he's right. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I was completely unaware of it until he had brought it to my attention. And, uh, and that, that's sort of my, that's the thing I'm working out. That's my, my therapy, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are there reoccurring things that you put in your work deliberately as opposed to discovering them later? Music. Um, I almost always have music. Most of my characters uh, can sing or play an instrument. I, I studied opera in Vienna. Oh, wonderful. Nice. Before I, but I, I was, I'm five foot two and I'm small and I wasn't mm. exactly built yeah. for the ground opera stage. Yeah. Um, and I while know. I had a nice voice, I didn't have, you know, that world-class voice. So I love it. And music is vitally important to me. So most of my characters, I, I deliberately made one character, you know, unable to carry a tune in a bucket just <laughs> for a change as opposed <laughs> to everybody else. But normally, yeah, I have. I always put music in, and I try to avoid putting horses in too much. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> As a sidebar, can you tell us a little about your horses? Oh yes, um, I have two. Uh, I have two Lusitanos. Lusitano is a Portuguese breed. Um, they were bred for bullfighting and for war, obviously. Mm, um, nice. And uh, they're brave and agile and smart and wonderful. And I have a white stallion named Vinto da Broga, 
and I have a buckskin gelding named Donador, who we call Noodles, because it just oh, fits him so well. Um, <laughs> Vinto, you, you, you cannot give Vinto a nickname. He, his dignity will not stand for it. <laughs> um, and I ride, I, I, I ride dressage, um, which is the equestrian sport for people with OCD. Um, <laughs> I, um, I had, I, you know, I started out riding Western because I lived in New Mexico. I grew up in New Mexico and then discovered jumping. And I jumped for years until I realized that you rarely heard about dressage riders killing themselves. <laughs> and uh, I'd had a lot of crashes. So then I switched yeah. to dressage and that's what I've been doing. So yes, those are my babies. <laughs> um, uh, Jay, did you have any other questions about riding? Um, well, actually you, you, uh, that no I no yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> so thank you absolutely yeah mine was just a general screenwriting question what advice would you give somebody that was interested in getting into screenwriting um read scripts mm -hmm. and read the scripts while you watch the movie hmm. are the episode that the the screenplay connects to um so you see what worked what didn't what changed why it changed I think that's important, um, and it's. It used to be there was only one place you could get screenplays, but now they're all over the internet. You know, just yep. and they post them, and you can go and read them. And I think seeing what people do. Um, the other thing is get a. You know, if you can afford it, get Final Draft. It's the. Um, it is the oh, yeah, industry cool. standard for what we're using now. Um, I know Scrivener though also has a screen. I use Scrivener for my novels. Mm -hmm. And they also have a screenwriting function. I don't know how good it is. I've never tested it out. But, you know, have something that helps you make sure the form is proper. Um, and then once you write your screenplay, or even if you just have an idea, mm -hmm. you should by all means register it with the Writers Guild of America. Okay. It's open to anybody. You don't have to be a member to register your, your idea or your screenplay. And it's a protection for you. Um, against having having it ripped off, frankly, mm -hmm. um, it costs. I believe it's twenty five dollars, and they will they receive it, they stamp it, and they then they keep it for you, and then you can prove this was mine. This was my screenplay, uh, because mm -hmm. once you start sending it out, you know there's always the issue. Um, there are there are there are unscrupulous producers <laughs> in the world and you yeah. have to be a little bit careful. I was so, going to say, how often would you say it's a regular danger that um, people do get ripped off? Uh, more often than I would like to say. Mm. Um, it does happen. I mean, you know, the problem is that if somebody approaches you and says, I want to option your book or I loved your screenplay, before you agree to anything, go to IMDb and see who they are. You know, yeah. look mm -hmm. at their credentials because anybody can say, oh, I'm a producer. Um, and if you're not a right, I'm a writing producer, you know, a writer producer. But mm -hmm. there's the other kind of producers put talent and money together. They're the guys who go out there. But in that crowd, again, it's not like, you know, there's a lot of policing on who they are. So you want to, yeah. you do want to be sure of, of checking them out before you get in business with them because they're, you know, it, it's fairly notorious. And, and look, mm -hmm. honestly, ideas are cheap. I mean, any ideas are easy. It's execution that matters. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm always far more concerned about once you've written your spec screenplay. Um, and the other advice I would give is when I broke in, the, it was customary to write a spec television episode if you wanted to be in tv yeah, for sure. now that's not the way it works now they want to see like your spec pilot mm -hmm. or your feature film because they're more interested in seeing what your ideas are and what you bring than you know if you can write an episode imitate. of yeah imitate something else um so it's it's a somewhat different world than than when i broke in but that, um, that would be my primary advice thank you very much for for those of you in the audience that don't know, a spec script uh, for an episode usually was like if there was a show running, let's say Westworld, since you brought it up, while Westworld was running, you would write a script for that show with those characters and try to like imitate the mood and the characters to make sure that your writing style could mesh well with the one that already existed. 
And here's an interesting aside. When it was George Martin, George R. R. Martin, who got me into mm-hmm. screenwriting, and he oh, really? advised me on all of this. Yeah, I can tell that story if, if, if anybody's yes, interested. Please. Um, yeah, please do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but George said the other thing is smart agents or managers. Like if I had written a spec Westworld script, they would never send it to Westworld. Oh, for sure. Because they're going to say they're all they're going to see are the mistakes that I made. But they might send that script to if you know. Mr. Robot were still going, they might send it there instead um, because they would go, oh, that looks like a really good Westworld script. You know, even it, it's you don't want to go to the show that you wrote the spec for. It never right. works out. So um, how I got into Hollywood. Yeah, <laughs> yes, definitely. Yes, please. please. Um, <laughs> OK, so George had moved down to New Mexico and we all got to know each other. We were all in a role playing group together and we became nice. very good friends. And uh, it's Wait, actually I'm sorry. out of. I'm sorry to interrupt. What role playing game were you playing? Good question. Um, well, we, we started out by introducing George to Morrow Project and then we played nice. Call of Cthulhu. Oh, nice. And nice. then, and then um, our friend Victor Milan made the mistake of giving George Superworld. And George huh. ran Superworld for us obsessively, and we played obsessively. <laughs> nice, and then George nice. and I decided to, as George said, turn this obsession into money. And so we, <laughs> created, we created our book series called Wild Cards. Mm-hmm. And book uh-huh. number 28, which I edited and wrote for, is coming out uh, in Britain uh, in May. Nice. So we're up to 28 books in our shared world anthology that George awesome. and I oversee as the great gods of the universe here <laughs> um, that grew out of a role playing game. So, <laughs> OK, um, so I'm going to read these books knowing that this was your role play. <laughs> which character which character were you playing? Uh, I actually didn't use the character I played, but I created Dang. a new one. I created the alien who um, who brought the alien virus to Earth to field test it. So for, yeah. for the people who don't know what Wild Cards is, what's the what's the pitch on that? Wild Cards is a is a is a longest running shared world anthology all about what really happens to the world when superheroes appear in 1946 and the changes to our culture and our world and um, it's. I was actually the executive producer on uh, the TV show that unfortunately didn't move forward, but I was in a writer's room for 10 months um, nice. working on that last year. And we're hoping to set it up again someplace else because we do things that most superhero shows and books don't do. We look at the real world ramifications in terms of politics, society, mm. culture, um, and we also have a group of people who are the underclass that allow us to explore issues of racism and classism and in in very different ways. So that's amazing. And there are ramifications. Also, if you die in wild cards, you stay dead. <laughs> nice. <laughs> no. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, we... that's one of that's one of George's and my pet peeves is you know don't you ask know, me for an. Em- I was going to say George. Response and, <laughs> George seems to be pretty good about uh, people dying about and being dead. Yeah. Die. So. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's vicious. <laughs> I'm I'm actually so glad you said that because um, uh, one of the things uh, that I complain about a lot is exactly that, like in all the Marvel movies where they would quote unquote kill a character so that you would feel sad and then the character would come back five minutes later. I'm just like, stop using these cheap tactics. It's yes. cheating. So yeah, it's, I'm, it's, I'm very glad you said that. Yeah, no, no, we we feel very strongly about that. You know, dead Me is too. dead. And uh, and and it's it's a cheat to the audience, and eventually they become cynical and they don't care. And, yes, I had a you know. I had a meltdown about that exact subject a couple of episodes ago, actually. <laughs> Sabrina is a very passionate. Oh, yeah, Sabrina is very passionate about writing. <laughs> so yeah. every episode we have, she goes off on a tangent about something, and I'm like, I love it. <laughs> Please open my eyes. Open <laughs> oh, my please. eyes. Just call me out like that. <laughs> Absolutely, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was exactly that. It was a character died and then didn't die, and I and the whole theme was about mortality. So I was very angry. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I share I share your fury. Believe me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is actually an excellent uh, movement into the next thing I wanted to ask you. What is it about sci-fi specifically as a genre that draws you for writing? Like, does it oh. make it easier to deal with certain genre, certain uh, certain themes, or you just like creating worlds? What's it? I like creating worlds. And mm-hmm. from the time I was a little kid, I always wanted the stars. I mean, you know, <laughs> I wanted a spaceship. I wanted to go out and see, you know, what was out there, you know, what's waiting for us. 
um, because that sense of adventure. Yeah. But but as a writer, I think one of the things science fiction does for us, aside from the fact I just love it, it allows us to investigate difficult, uncomfortable issues a bit at arm's length. It gives yeah. people a safe space to think about racism, um, you know, gender issues, and to analyze that, analyze their own reactions without it feeling judgmental or as if mm -hmm. they're being, you know, put on the spot. And I think that's one of the things that science fiction does really well. It can, you know, take us into issues. I mean, you know, if you look at Westworld, what is humanity? Uh, what makes human? Um, is, is it inevitable that artificial life and humans will be unable to live in harmony? Um, you know, Elon Musk seems to think so. He's pretty convinced that, that the AIs are going to kill us. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I think that's one of the great strengths of science fiction. And I think it also just allows people to, in a way, it's easier to pretend to be a hero if, if, if they're, I, I don't even know how to if quite say this. If we lack the moral ambiguity of the world that we're currently in. Yeah, exactly. And, and if you're trying to say, how do I be heroic in this era? I mean, heroic in this era are, are the people on the front line in those hospitals and the people in our grocery stores, you know, who mm -hmm. are making sure the shelves are stocked and, and, yeah. you know, bringing, uh, those are heroes, but A, but that doesn't feel, feel heroic. It doesn't feel heroic. And most of us are too scared. I mean, a lot of us are, would be too scared to do it. I mean, you know, to put yourself in that situation. So you feel like I can't do that. But if you're, you know, if you're Star Lord or somebody else, you can, you can at least pretend, um, you know, that maybe I could be that person. So I think it teaches lessons about heroism. I mean, I love the Marvel movies for the most part. Where I don't love them is when they're all about the CGI big battles. Yep. I'm much more interested in those character moments. I mean, my favorite, honestly, of all of them was Captain America, the first Avenger. The first half of that movie was a jewel. Yes. Um, yes, yes, yes. You know, it, it, because that is about humanity. You know, I don't want to kill anybody. I just don't like bullies. I mean, you know, what a great, what a great statement. Um, mm -hmm. and Erskine, you know, it, it, it doc, his relationship with Dr. Erskine, but anyway, I'll stop geeking out <laughs> again. I, <laughs> I can listen for, yeah, absolutely. Go yeah. as long as you um, like. <laughs> uh, I don't want to come on too strongly, but the answer that you gave me is, uh, that's exactly why sci-fi is important to me. And, uh, I love you now. So uh, <laughs> well, thank you. When all of this is over and I get back to LA, <laughs> we'll have to get together and have yes, a cup of coffee. Yes, cool. Let me know, and I will. I live in the the San Francisco area. I will make that drive. Yeah, I will drive will down. Drive down. I, 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 I live yeah. in Colorado, yeah. and I will also make the drive. <laughs> I live in Wisconsin. I'll start driving right now. Just let me know. Guys, <laughs> stop right. cutting in on my coffee date. No. <laughs> well, you know, I wanted to interject, and and um, so uh, and you know, everyone in the podcast knows this, but uh, one of the things that drew me to sci-fi in general when I was younger um, was I was in kind of a rough situation growing up you know and, and it, when you're a kid you don't have control but for that hour for that two hours of a movie or whatever i could tune out the insanity that was my world and i could feel like i was part of something bigger or better or different you know like ju just something that just took me out of my out of my reality and allowed me to yeah. exist in a better one even if it was just for a half hour or an hour or two hours and that's you know Anything, anytime you, you have fiction, especially, I've, I've always been drawn to science fiction, but fiction in general, um, those fantasy worlds, they're, they're, they are therapeutic. You know what I mean? Like they, they really are, um, this amazing outlet for letting your mind just tune out all the crazy that's going on in reality and be a part of something so much better. And, or, or, I mean, it's sometimes worse, you know, it doesn't have to be better, but it's just something different and something that allows you to, had, had, like almost change your existence for that that little period of time which mm -hmm. it, it makes yeah. all the difference so i mean you know i i come from you know science fiction and fiction in general being my therapy when i was a kid i i couldn't afford a therapist so i would go into these you know books these movies these tv shows that allowed me to exist 
in a different realm. And it, it really did help me, you know, get to oh. to where I am now, you know? <clears throat> Yeah, when my parents would have their screaming fights, sometimes I couldn't even hear them because I was reading a yep. book. So I know exactly yep. what you're talking about. I mean, and I think that's, <laughs> I mean, and, you know, I'll, I'll bring it up because it's like the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. I, I think that had always been the appeal of Star Trek. Yeah. Um, oh, was yeah. that sense of, you know, a united humanity and hopeful and optimistic. And, you know, even in the Cold War, there was a Russian and there was a woman in, in a position of power, even though she was yeah. a telephone operator. Yeah. You know, at yeah. least she was there. Um, and and so I think that was that that sense of hope is uh, which is why I by and large, I don't like reading, um, you know, apocalyptic books or dystopias mm -hmm. you know i i'm a big proponent of the happy ending there is nothing wrong with the happy ending <laughs> absolutely <laughs> we, we do need some happy endings every once in a while especially right now oh yeah absolutely mm -hmm. so i wanted to also touch on the transformative nature of the metaphor of fiction and how much like i i tell the story over and over again that like star trek actually literally cured me of homophobia in one episode um, I grew up, you know, uh, Christian, and, like, I had my values, and I knew where I stood. And then they did the asexual episode, where Riker goes to the asexual planet, and the woman gives a speech at the end, where she says, who are you to tell me how to live? And, 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 I, and like, in one episode, in that moment, I was like, <gasps> I've been the bad guy this entire time! Oh my god! <laughs> and, yeah, like, that never left me. So, like, yeah, me and science fiction go way back, and, like, yeah, it's it's perfect therapy, just by going to a library so yeah <laughs> it's yeah. also an, ex an excellent example of what uh, you were saying earlier uh, about sci-fi giving you a distance mm -hmm. from um your personal issue uh, or behavior or whatever so that you can be more objective about it and then make that decision that way like hold on wait i'm on the wrong side here yeah. <laughs> or right side or whatever yeah um, um can i ask a quick question about yeah. uh science fiction here so my, my question for you is like the uh, your your view of the landscape of science fiction. Uh, I want to know what was like that first hint of like holy crap, what science fiction, and then like um, kind of like your feelings on like your favorite eras and how things have changed over the eras. So what was like your first kind of like the spark? <laughs> well, it was my dad. <laughs> my dad taught me to read before I went to school. And he also used to read me bedtime stories. And the, the book that he chose, he would read to me 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And he left out all the fish stuff, you know, <laughs> he would sort of focus on the exciting parts. But again, it was that a different world, a mysterious captain, you know, a ship that could have been a spaceship, you know. I mean, there was – and so I think he instilled in me this, this love of science fiction right from the beginning. And he was a voracious reader. My dad had insomnia. He would read a book a night. I mean, he was, he was crazy. Um, hmm. And so, uh, you know, that was the start. And then – I, at the library, the very first science fiction book I can remember reading all by myself was A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Cool. And I think I was seven. Um, and, and then at around age 10, um, we were on a visit to my dad's part, business partners in Los Angeles, and I was bored. And I was a kid. They took me to a bookstore because that's where I wanted to be all the time. <laughs> and I picked up... Um, the the lord of the rings and they only wanted to buy me the first book but i was insistent that i wanted all three of those amazing books with those covers you know those those old bantam I can't oh, remember, bantam yeah. Red, yeah with the the sort of weird map and everything and so they bought me all three books and i spent the entire weekend in our friend rodney's house sitting in the bedroom upstairs and i read all three books <laughs> and, uh, over like three days and then I realized I had just gobbled them, and so I started all over again. And in fact, I think I've read The Lord of the Rings like seven times, seven or eight nice. times, all the way through <laughs> through my life. It's it's a place I go, you know, just to find peace um, uh, and and security. Um, science fiction has changed profoundly. Uh, I mean, we've gone from you know the sort of uh, blasters and manly men doing manly things, you know, <laughs> of the of the early eras into a much more interesting, diverse uh, science Rogers. fiction. Yeah, the the Buck Rogers, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's certainly right, enjoyable. But I think we've gone to a place where, uh, you know, 
this is literature. I mean, I've always hated yeah. that dichotomy anyway, but um, <laughs> certainly now we much more so. And, um, and also we won. I mean, my God, all of, all of entertainment <laughs> is, is, uh, you know, we inherit the geeks inherited the earth, mm-hmm. whether sure. it's, yes. you know, whether it's this in, in regards to storytelling at least. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Whether it's gaming, uh, our, our, television or movies or whatever it happens to be um Mm -hmm. we won it it's it's our (laughs) world um and unfortunately we bitch about it too much instead of saying oh thank you thank you thank you (laughs) more stuff more stuff (laughs) yeah stop stop complaining and enjoy what's there uh we do have a lot of sci-fi now i just wish that more of it was uh optimistic (laughs) (laughs) sci-fi yeah well um it it does I know it doesn't feel as apocalyptic. I mean, I don't do zombies. Zombies bore me. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, that's, that's not a genre I particularly, you know, know much about. But but it does feel like some of the others um, are are raising interesting questions, you know. And Do you feel there's a certain part of science fiction we're not getting enough of lately? Um, I wish we had more space, you know, based science fiction. Um, Rather than like Westworld being. Yeah, I mean, I I love Westworld. Don't get me wrong, but I I really would like more. I mean, I, more Guardians of the Galaxy, please. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, give me spaceships you... and and different planets. I understand <laughs> why we can't do that. I mean, I'm in the industry, um, right? I you know my my manager. I have this big space opera book series I've been writing, and he's like, "Ooh, everybody wants that," and I said. They say they do. <laughs> they really Why do you don't. feel we aren't getting that? Because, like, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to know. Like, I, I hit a deficit of like, yeah, I, I miss spaceships and stuff. So I finally went back to Stargate, and now like I'm running the end of like the Stargate that I have. I'm like, oh god, oh god, I'm gonna run out again. Oh, no, <laughs> no. Why aren't we getting more? <laughs> well, it, 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 expense is a lot of it. I mean, and mm-hmm. and yeah. um, you know, it, it's a lot of effect shots and spaceships, and there is this sort of attitude in the industry that. Spaceships means Star Trek and nothing else. Only Star Trek works. Now, The Expanse, I think, is starting to at least nibble at the edges of that and yeah. say, no, actually, spaceships can work. Uh, but then yeah. you get into the added problem of, of aliens. I mean, like I said uh, to my manager, we can't do my series. The, the, the treatment of aliens as second-class citizens is a huge part of my books. And we have to have the five alien species the makeup costs or the CGI costs would make this virtually impossible to do. And uh, I mean, we, we ran into that in wild cards because we have this group of people who have been twisted by the virus and changed their physicality into sort of horrific forms. The makeup we knew we were looking at with some of the Joker, we call them jokers and our, our superheroes are called aces and wild cards. Um, nice. We knew we were looking at like six hours of makeup on some of these major Joker characters, which means you can shoot for four hours, I mean, you yeah. know, or three hours. Yeah. Yeah. And so all of that becomes a real issue. And, and uh, you know, I mean, maybe the, the avatar technology can be scaled down to be useful, but, you know, I don't know that that's been established yet. Yeah, we're not there quite yet. And all that's been put on pause. <laughs> yes, we are on pause oh, very yeah. much. Yeah, everyone is. Absolutely. Um, I love that you brought up. You guys- oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just love that you brought up the Expanse. It's one of my favorites right now. I was actually going to ask about it if uh, you didn't bring it up because it, it it does take place in space, but it doesn't do as much uh, exploration like uh, Star Trek or like Firefly did. It's okay. I admit I I'm only a couple episodes in, but I but it's like. What's incredible it's about it is that I've read like the first couple books and like uh, seen the entire series. It's the first space science fiction I've ever seen that treats our solar system like science fiction usually treats the galaxy. Yes, well, I, it, uh, which... Ty and Daniel are friends of mine, <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, I, I actually have read all. I love the books. I think they're brilliant writers, and the books are fantastic. I can't wait for the ninth book that's coming out this summer. <laughs> um, but um, I also read the first book in crit group in our critique group so i read it in manuscript oh and nice the expanse started as a game <laughs> at that Ooh. time that one too, Ty, huh? 
Ty Frank was running it. In fact, I actually played in it. And one when he was running it for us here in New Mexico, I was the captain of the Rosinante. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh my God. That's amazing. Did you the ship? And George was wow. playing a space Sorry. pirate. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so yeah, you know, um, I have I have fond I, I have great fondness for the expanse. I mean, uh, the, the books are amazing. So. I, what system did you guys use? A uh, GURPS. Uh, well, no, cool. I think Ty ran a different one. Ty Ty used a different system that I'm was less familiar with. Um, mm. More percentile based than GURPS, which is a little simpler and. I like GURPS. It's was straightforward. And also, I had mm-hmm. my pretty D20 dice, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, nice. of course, of course, of course, of course. I have a very, uh, very, you know, very like... important question. Okay. How do we get in on these games? <laughs> no Just we kidding. We have to restart them. I mean, unfortunately, everybody... I mean, I love it because all my friends have become very successful, <laughs> and I also hate it because none of us have none of us get to do it anymore. Yeah, um, yeah. I was wondering. I, I, miss, I miss it so much. Oh, oh my god. Um, I have to confess to you. Sorry for the three of you. I'm just gonna like cut in with a personal. Moment <laughs> do it. Here. Um, go, go. Uh, I I've been playing. Uh, I was an improv in college and an improv team, and um. Two members of that improv team moved to New York, but, you know, we love spending time together, so we've been playing tabletop role plays um, over the internet, and um, one of them has written a book series based on one of our campaigns that we finished, and uh, uh, I'm going to tell her, I'm like, listen, this is how a lot of famous (laughs) books have been written. Um, I also just created a tabletop uh, system for, like, an an investigative uh, paranormal adventure. So it, if you want me to run a game for you, I would be more than happy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I have two other invitations to play online. I just, I haven't jumped in yet because it, you know, part of the fun of being in a role-playing group is all of you gathered in the living room with, with lots of useless snacks, you know, yes. you're, mm-hmm. you know, I, you, I you gotta have your, part. yeah, you gotta have your Cheetos and, and your, <laughs> and your chips and salsa. Your you know? Mountain Dew. <laughs> you are family. You're so cool, One of us. Yeah. One yeah. of yeah. us. And, and of course, Jay, you're behind you I mean, catch I up usually on the would make brownies or chocolate chip cookies. Ooh. You, know? Ooh. you gotta have, you gotta have the, you gotta fuel the, you gotta fuel the bod while you're fighting monsters. Well, or are, were those so. normal brownies or Nor- normal brownies? <laughs> yeah. We are really, shifting. We are dull people. <laughs> <laughs> we aren't even. We don't even drink much. I mean, we. <laughs> I mean, we clearly, you, science fiction. Yeah, right, right. I was gonna say clearly, your um, your combined imagination makes up for anything that other people need to t- to imbibe. <laughs> I think that's totally true. Yeah, when you're, when you're in a role playing group with Daniel Abraham, George R. R. Martin, at one point Roger Zelazny was in our gaming group. Wow. Well, you know, yeah, Walter John Williams. Yeah, you kind of look around and go, wow. <laughs> you know, this well, this is certainly giving me hope for my future. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah. Speaking of gaming, uh, so are you saying that you don't get much time to do tabletop gaming anymore since like everybody's pretty busy? Yes. <laughs> um, the, the next question would be to to fill that hole. Um, are you finding that uh, what video games are you going to to get that itch scratched? Um. Uh. Well, let's see. Right now, I'm playing Pillars of Infinity because it's a lot like Dragon Age, which is my favorite favorite game ever. Oh, nice. Um, I'm running through Dragon wow. Age again right now. Uh. Yeah. I. I just. Um. The second one was trash. It was supposed to just be a um, DL, but nice. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, God. But no, 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 please, please. No, um, we, we like talking smack about our future. We, we yeah, do. We I do. Mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm it's all playing fun Dragon, Age, Dragon Origins Age Origins right now. Oh, my God. It's the best game ever. And I love Claudia Black, and I love Zephyr. She's so great. My problem is I, I don't like the, the AI for the, the characters. I keep, like, running into problems for the combat, and I'm like, why is the combat so bad when the plot is so good? Because it was such an early game. I mean, just yeah. the narrative. It is the best narrative story. And and be careful. Don't If you play as a complete bastard or you're an awful human being, you will go into the final battle. Your people will walk away from you. They will come. Your companions will abandon cool. you, which I love. There are moral choices. And anytime you want. I've, I've played it through completely four times. So if you need nice. any coiters, let me know. Just email me. You know, we'll talk. Um, I love that game, and and uh, Dragon Age Three is very very good. I can't wait for four. 
I enjoyed Mass Effect. I played all three games twice. Quit before the last fifteen minutes of the last game. They no, blew the ending. no, they they, they did blow the ending. But Mass Effect <laughs> is my favorite series. The second I one love, is the best. I love it. I love that those games. But the ending is it. It was a mess, and um, I was heartbroken. <laughs> so I wrote an yeah. enormous piece of fan fiction to finish yes. it my way. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> can, we, can, we will can find you, you to see can this. You if email you can me share. this fan fiction. Yeah, yeah. Please. I just it's on my website. <laughs> oh? It's on my okay. website under perfect, writing. Perfect. I knew it. Yeah, perfect, it's perfect. my yeah. shepherd and his relationship and how it ends and. It was supposed to be comedic, and it turned into a big story about PTSD and survivor's guilt. But, good, so, good, 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 um, good, anyway, good, good. Yeah, no, Perfect. I wrote 140 freaking pages of fan fiction, <laughs> which I have nothing against. Fan fiction is awesome. But I was so angry over that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, perfect, perfect. I the longest brought... fan fiction I've ever written is 150K, so I understand. Yeah, it was, I, 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 the spirit moved me because I was like, how dare you? I brought together this <laughs> I, huge oh, and So you, I knew when you said Mass right. Effect, I, Sabrina just perked up. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Not just Sabrina, uh, all Mass Effect is oh, also yeah. like my top game. Um, I'm wondering, uh, so I got two questions. Oh, where do I start? Let's start with Mass Effect. Um, uh, I'm like, like the only person I know that really wasn't that bothered by the ending. Don't hit me. Um, but like, yeah. <laughs> Wait, which one? Like, which one? The pre DLC ending or the post DLC ending? Both. Um, I like the DLC ending where I got to have like all the people hang together one more time, um, make the final decision for the galaxy. Are Although you going to be red, blue, the... or green? I went for uh, shoot um, some kind of like, whatever would be like the most Do balanced. Do you take over I, I, the I Reapers? Decided not you to... get rid of the Reapers, or you make the humans and the AI friends? friends okay there you go that's the green yeah so so um melinda what didn't you like and what ending did you choose if we can ask okay i didn't like it because they they indicated to me that my efforts to create comedy and unity between the ais between all the divergent alien races we had come together to defeat an enemy and it mattered not at all and yep they yeah. they violated a cardinal sin. They rang in a new bad guy in the last twenty minutes of the game. Ooh. Who Can't is this kid? Whatsoever. Who is the star kid? I mean, out of nowhere. And I thought it needed to be who it was sovereign. Who is the big reaper? The name of the big reaper? Yeah, sovereign. Sovereign. It needed to be sovereign. And if mm-hmm. sovereign had put himself in the form of that child, then. But it was never set up, and it, all of it felt felt rushed and and like a cheat. Um, yeah, definitely. And especially, I had worked so hard to try to bring mm-hmm. everybody together, and then to have it not matter was that was an enormous betrayal of the players who had mm-hmm. committed Fully so agree. many hours of game. That's the one thing that Andromeda <clears throat> fixed, I think. Aside from that, it's not really. I'm not really a big fan of Mass Effect Andromeda. It was kind of a remake of the I couldn't, trilogy. I couldn't play it. I, I played 30 Good. hours and Don't. gave up. I just Don't. went, eh, you know, Andromeda didn't work for me, even though I but tried that's, it. That's but that's the one thing that was different. At the end, all the, 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 the allies that you made did show up, and they did make a difference. And they made a difference. Hmm. Well, that would have been nice. I didn't get to the end because I got bored. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's another I, dungeon crawl. Um, I understand. I forced myself to finish it. The other thing I played is, through all of it. Oh, good, good. <laughs> no, the ending that I picked, and I picked it because the relationship that Shepard had to um, the Admiral, when the Admiral comes up and says, we got to get rid of these mofos, and I was like, you are absolutely right. <laughs> you know? And I had the option for the green ending, and I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Um, no, I, I, I blasted them into you know oblivion. Um, <laughs> I was like, we're done. Um, because you can't offer me... Um, my my mentor and and have me reject him and I certainly wasn't going to listen to the elusive man you know yeah. what a creep mm-hmm. um and <laughs> and after fighting these things and watching the reapers kill literally trillions of of living creatures I was like uh no <laughs> you're dead good call good <laughs> you know? call so no I killed them all um <laughs> nice. but no I was very frustrated because it <clears throat> It could have been the greatest, greatest franchise of all time. And as a result, it uh, I have to give Dragon Age, it has the edge for me over Mass Effect mm-hmm. only because they end it so much better. And you will see when you get there. I can't wait to discuss it with you, Sabrina. <laughs> excellent, excellent. I, excellent. Um, but what about Knights of the Republic? Oh, I love oh, yep. Knights of the Old Republic. Yes. 
Um, yeah. I haven't that time yet. Yeah, Star Wars time. Let's. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before we go to Star Wars, because I know that that's going to take a big chunk. <laughs> oh, that's going to take yeah. the rest. Of yeah, time. I have one question uh, that I want to interject real quick, and I want to ask: What is your favorite sci-fi series? Like books, movies, TV? Like what? What is the epitome of your like? What is your favorite sci-fi? Favorite sci-fi? God, this is such a hard question because I love yeah, so that's much really of difficult. it, and that's acceptable um, too. <laughs> okay, if I'm if I must answer, I will say my favorite sci-fi is in fact Star Wars. Okay, um, okay, hell yeah. And then okay. w- one, Wars, mm-hmm. yes, yeah. Uh, Which part oh of my Star Wars? <laughs> Oh uh, yeah. Well, not these latest. Uh, not the latest. Ones. <laughs> not the okay. latest movies. Yeah. No. Doubt. What, what kind of what yeah. what, what kind of time crunch are we on? <laughs> yeah, it, I'll be good. I'll go more than let's go more than the hour. It's not like I'm eager cool. to go and do more proof and more polish on this. More proof anyway, so, <laughs> that I have to get back to. Um, okay. Yeah. Favorite Star Wars, like a movie or a TV show or a book, whatever. A movie, Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. Um, nice. I mean, damn near a perfect what other answer yeah. is there? <laughs> yep. Yeah, and um, and, and, and in terms of the series, you know, Clone Wars, Rebels. It's hard, but I think I'm going to give it to Rebels. Hmm. A little, just nice. a little. Wow, nice. Clone Wars. Um, and my, part of that might be the fact there's a character I love. <laughs> in it, but, Kara. Uh, I do, I do really, you know, I think, I think the two animated and the Mandalorian is incredible. Oh, it's so good. The second, mm-hmm. second so season. good. And it's so good. Um, yeah, but, uh, no, I, I, How about book? Yeah. <laughs> Star Wars book. Sorry. I've actually only read Timothy Zahn's Thrawn books. I Which don't tend to read a lot of, uh, tie-in, um, just mm-hmm. because there's, you know, so much out there. And also I'm writing my own stuff or writing my own work, work. but, yeah. um, right. yeah, the only ones I've read are, are the Thrawn novels and they're excellent. So I, you know, I, I have read the Darth Vader comics cause I, I love Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about what was your uh what was it uh yeah i me and my buddies all read this the the timothy zahn stuff um what was it like when you first read them for you like because like i remember like back in that era like it was like star wars had kind of just freaking disappeared and then out of the ether comes these books and like do you feel this was like a, a good follow-up or do you yeah well i actually haven't it? read the earlier ones i've only read the latest ones that he's done the three um thrawn and alliances oh. and i have not read the early ones i i keep meaning to but i've been kind of busy um and <laughs> so yeah i have not actually read the ones that are from the legends era versus you know the the new canon um so uh, you know i think the idea i mean he very much is a sherlock holmesian character and uh and and i like holmes i've always enjoyed those yeah. stories so i think Perfect. there's i think there's something that is very appealing about a man who you know is so cerebral um and tries to be decent within the parameters of what decency implies within the empire um mm-hmm. so yeah i but I've enjoyed them so, um, and and I think that the um, uh, the Darth Vader comics. I'm blanking on the writer's name. Uh, Sole Sole. Um, that the the new run of Darth Vader comics have been amazing. <laughs> These graphic I've novels. They're great. Yeah, they're great. They're just they're great. Um, let's see. Going back I'm gonna to. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Uh, oh, please, please go. Can you tell me about your favorite character in Rebels and w- what it is about that specific character that like draws you so strongly? Um, it's Agent Callus. Um, it's nice. it's the um, it's the ISB agent. Uh, I I'm actually uh, my agent my new my literary agent is actually mm-hmm. we're trying to talk to the star. I really want to write a novel about him, um, a prequel, an earlier, uh, because I'm fascinated with the Empire, uh, especially uh-huh. in this era of Trump. I'm fascinated with why people would embrace that, you know, what that, what that means. Um, you know, why do you serve? I mean, I like redemption stories and he has an yes. interesting one. Um, also there was a great voice actor you know, <laughs> doing the, doing the, the role. 
Um, and so that, you know, I think all of the characters are terrific. Um, you know, Hera is a wonderful character, the captain of the, of the she's ghost. She's my favorite. She's, she's wonderful character. Um, yeah, she's Luke Skywalker level for me. Yeah, she's, um, and, and Sabine, I mean, it's, it's actually, it's just, it's a great bunch of characters, but, but for me, Agent Callus is my favorite character. Um, just like, I guess, you know, in Star Wars, it's, it's Darth Vader and Leia, um, who are the two that, that um i mean you know luke bless his heart it's always hard to be a hero um yeah heroes heroes are intrinsically end up kind of dull um yeah. and and that's not their fault you know it's it's a, we have to imbue them with all of the good aspects that we want um and, and villains really good are people are kind of boring yeah really good i mean that's what was wrong with next generation <laughs> i mean you know <laughs> um perfect people are, are dull and so it's more fun when when you have complex characters mm -hmm. um so and and i think rebels in clone wars i mean clone wars salvaged anakin i mean you suddenly yeah. your heart is breaking when you know what's coming you know lip trembling yeah me and my friends we had accepted how much we hated the prequel anakin and we were like well that that's done so like i made sure we all made sure not to watch clone wars until it was way over until like a friend of mine like twisted my arm behind my back and says no keith you need to see this and yeah, like it took over everything. We just said, "Oh my god, I think, I think this is Top Empire Strikes Back for us." But it takes you know several seasons to do it. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and I, 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 I was, you know, and, and I had this sort of, well, I don't watch cartoons. And then a friend of mine mm -hmm. said, "You have to watch Clone Wars." Well, I just gobbled. I binged it. I couldn't. <laughs> I was like, "Oh my god, I can't stop." And then another friend said, "Okay, you liked Clone Wars? You've got to check out Rebels." <laughs> and, uh, and then it and, ate your life. And they they have eaten my life. Yeah. The well, ghost is such a there. gorgeous spaceship. I'm sorry. Uh, the ghost is such a gorgeous spaceship. I, I put it over the Millennium Falcon <laughs> in my. Uh... Uh, anyway, well, we don't get to spaceships. we don't get to see enough of the Millennium Falcon. I mean, that's the problem mm. with the ghost. You know, it, it feels like a comfortable old pair of shoes. You know, I know where mm -hmm. those bunks are and and where the the sort of common room is and where the galley is and you know it feels with the Millennium Falcon you saw a hallway, you know, the, <laughs> and and the the the, the, the pilot's area and then that was in the area where luke you know gets zapped by a by a drone a couple of times and they play <laughs> chess um I, yeah i mean i don't uh, i don't have a sense of the ship and i had a real sense of the ship in um in 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 rebels so big question about star wars uh can you tell us your feelings like each of the trilogies uh, well, obviously, I love the I love the first. I mean, the first, the, the, the one that launched the original trilogy. Um, although Return of the Knee High, it was kind of a letdown. Um, <laughs> I mean, the you know the the relationship, the father son thing that that worked great for me, um, mm -hmm. and the the romance. Um, I didn't, but the first two, um, I mean, they took my breath away. And listen, uh, uh, my confession time. People laugh at me, but I don't care. You won't laugh at me. So <clears throat> I was a deeply unhappy lawyer. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I can imagine. And Star Wars got me through the bar exam, the original film. I, I managed to survive the bar exam by going and seeing Star Wars like seven times. Um, and then the second movie came out, and I'm now practicing law. And my best friend at the time was a novelist, a man named Victor Milan. We had started going to see these movies together. And... I'm sitting there miserable. I'd met his friends, all the writing group, you know, Fred Saberhagen, Susie McKee Charnas, Zelazny. Mm -hmm. And we get to the scene where Yoda says to Luke, do or do not, there is no try. And I thought, that is so true. And mm -hmm. I don't want to be in this law office. If I stay here, I'm going to end up 30 years from now, bitter and angry and terrorizing some young associate the way I'm being terrorized. And I walked in the next day and I quit Wow! on the cool. spot. Nice. Good for you. Um, walked in love, typed my letter of resignation, put all my little stuff in a box, my diplomas and so forth, my little plant, <laughs> walked in, laid the letter on my boss's desk, and I walked out um, and said to Vic, help me write. And he became my mentor. Um and I started, you know, writing in secret till I had sold something. <laughs> um, and with just Vic helping me and knowing. 
And that was so, you know, I feel like I owe Star Wars this life that I love. Um, and I can never repay that, you know, and if I can repay it in some small way by getting to write, you know, one Star Wars novel, um, I would be I would be thrilled. Um, and I think that's so why we, in some ways it even though I, I grew up on Trek and, you know, I love Trek, Star Wars is more there's a richness to it. There's an aspirational quality to Star Trek, yes. but there's a richness to Star Wars mm -hmm. that makes me feel like I could live there. Yeah. And I'm not sure I don't exactly know how to live in the Federation because it feels a little <laughs> It's a little too good. <laughs> it's a little too clean, yeah. Well, it was. So we have Yoda <laughs> to thank. We have Yoda to thank for some of the best fiction that some of your fans have ever enjoyed. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes. I, oh, I, I, I owe Yoda um, a debt. So, <laughs> thank but you, thank you. <laughs> so how do you feel about the, uh, the um, prequel trilogy then? Um, you know, I went back and rewatched them. Um, the first one is a mess. I mean, look, the, the problem yeah. is that Lucas, Lucas is an editor. He's not a writer. Um, and that was mm -hmm. abundantly clear, unfortunately. Yep. Um, you know, Revenge of the Sith is not actually that bad of a movie. And even the, even the second one isn't as awful as I recalled it be. <laughs> you know, I mean, when I rewatched them, I went, okay, these are not as terrible. The first one is pretty terrible, but you know, although if you want the history, if you want to understand the grand sweep of things, especially now with rebels and you know all the other and Clone Wars, it was worth rewatching it. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the newest ones, you know, the first one was just a remake of of uh, A New Hope. I mean, it, it sure was, was the ex yeah. mm -hmm. exact same structure, exact same. I mean, which was disappointing. And now you may all shoot me. I really liked The Last Jedi. No. I actually did too. I think it had... Keith did not, but I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I understand. The pe uh, people have genuine love for it. It broke my heart, but yeah, please go ahead. No, I, I thought it was brave, and it it took chances, and it, it was a deconstruction of myth, yeah. and I thought that was fascinating. Um, and, and, uh, and I was so then disappointed when what followed it was The Rise of Skywalker, which... Ugh, I know I was there on opening the day first. because it's Star yeah. Wars, yeah. but I was I was so disappointed. Mm -hmm. um, it you t it mean, meant that that Anakin's sacrifice for his son meant nothing. Um, mm -hmm. it, it meant nothing. None of it meant anything at that point. So it's apocrypha, sort of like the last two seasons of Buffy are apocrypha. <laughs> <laughs> Buffy ended at the end of season five, yeah. and um, and. So, yeah, I mean, if I ever, I actually did purchase um, The Last Jedi because that one I will, I will probably rewatch. Um, there, was, there was something about it. That, and, and everybody complains about the second act on the, the, the casino planet. But I thought it made a very good point, which is, you know, who are the real villains? I mean, they're selling weapons to all sides. I mean, yeah. you know. Uh, in a war and that's kind of what I want if I ever get to do this Star Wars novel that's sort of what I want to look at is uh, you know we casually kill if you look at Clone Wars I'm sorry I'm just babbling no right. please okay. no 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 no. This, absolutely this is, what this is what we want to hear please I mean if you look at the kinds babbling. of conversations we have like off air so <laughs> if you look at the Clone Wars the death the clones the death of these men even though they're all identical supposedly um, is treated with, with, with great reverence, um, and they're acknowledged. And then when we get into the Empire proper, they kill stormtroopers as if they are Lego figures. Yes. And, they're, mm -hmm. and that bothers me. I mean, it's like yeah. the clones were bred to be cannon fodder. And yet we honor them with a sense of they grieve, they care for each other, they call each other brothers. We yeah. get to the stormtroopers who aren't clones, who are people who presumably signed up because they wanted three cots and a cot, you know? <laughs> or because they're kidnapped children. Yeah. <laughs> are kidnapped children, which I actually didn't like. I think it's actually more interesting if you say, why did you join the Wehrmacht in, yeah. in 1940? <laughs> you know, who yeah. is that person? Why? Mm -hmm. Why did they do mm -hmm. that? You know, yeah. are they necessarily you know, mustache twirling evil. No, I mean, people do things. These people who are out in the streets of Wisconsin screaming about wanting to go get their hair done when they could, 
carry yeah. home a virus. You know, why? What is it that impels these people? And that is what interests me. Um, if you if you just say it's kidnapped, then it, it, it loses some of the analysis of what happens to a society and a culture. How did the Clone Wars lead people to say, yeah, that's what I want, the empire? You know? Yeah. Why did people Absolutely. vote for Donald Trump? <laughs> yeah. you know, what what was wrong with the society that made people say, "Yeah, that guy." Mm -hmm. Yeah, what are you um, trying to say with this? Yeah. yeah. If you ever want to explore that, there's a book series I keep recommending that does the the greatest exploration of why people do what they do. It's called Three Body Problem. It's Chinese oh, right. science fiction. Yes. Yeah. It transformed me like Star Trek did. I it, it yeah, certainly I, did because you haven't stopped talking about it. <laughs> I will never stop talking about it. <laughs> uh, a thing I admire. That's definitely not a bad thing. Yeah. Like good. Mm. I'm glad something has affected you so strongly that you want to like affect other people's lives with it. You know, since we're talking about Star Wars and and we're talking about science fiction, we have this amazing guest. I want to. I, this is something we haven't talked about on the podcast because obviously we're mostly a Star Trek podcast. But uh, Rogue One. How do you all feel about that? Because I oh. loved loved Rogue One. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. Loved it. Yes. I, that's the other one I bought immediately. Mm -hmm. I, like, I have to have this movie. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it was about that movie and how it came together and, and just the, the writing, the characters, the story. It was it was so amazing. It just it literally shocked me at how how good it was. And except, that, oh, go ahead. Except for just uh, the weird like Tarkin and young Leia uh, graphics. Mm -hmm. Those weirded me out, but aside from that, yeah, yeah, it, it, that the uncanny me, valley is always a problem. Um, yep. No, I mean it was it was just yeah, it was it was perfection. I loved that movie. Um, I was I was so, and I thought the, it it was courageous. I mean, I, at the end, I I my breath, I literally took my breath away, and I sat there thinking, this is a Disney Star Wars movie <laughs> <laughs> with this ending, right? Oh my God! Because it was the perfect ending. It was the only ending. I just got chills. Do anything right. Else <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um. I'm glad you said it like that. Uh, as a writer, th there's always I, I'm. You know more about this than I do, but there's that moment where like I, I feel that a story is well structured. If I get to the ending, I'm like, there's there's no other way it can end. If there's yes. several ways that it can end, like you didn't you didn't do it solid. I agree. Yeah. No, I, you have to write to that conclusion. You have to take the reader there or the, or the viewer there and they have to say, yep, that was inevitable. That was, and, and you have to f foreshadow it. And they did so yeah. beautifully all the way through the movie. Uh, there was that quote from uh, your friend, George, uh, <laughs> where he said, you know, like if you start writing a book and, um, uh, a specific character has done it, and then on the internet they guess that that specific character has done it. So you change the ending, then the whole the whole thing is garbage, mm -hmm. basically. Yes, um, yeah. that's not a direct quote, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get the gist. Yes. Um. So, let me ask you how you feel about the final trilogy, spe specifically in regards to whether it's. I personally would say it's not a trilogy because the three books, the three movies were clearly developed separately and not with like an overall arc. How do yeah. you feel about that? <laughs> you are absolutely right. Um, this felt like a mad scramble. Um, it did not feel like they had sat down and, and thought this thing through. I mean, really, I, I would rather have seen it be a television series, especially with what we're doing now, where you can plot these, these 10, 12 episode arcs. Yeah. And have the time, um, but yeah, it, it it felt like a panicked response out of out of Disney <laughs> and um, and disappointing. So you know, again, I I'm probably won't watch. You know, they're, they're not something that I'm eager to rewatch except yeah. for Last Jedi. I mean, that would be the only one because uh, it felt very human. So you know, I don't know what they're going to do. I think. Fortunately, you know, they're giving us this lovely last season of Clone Wars um, and we've got the Mandalorian <clears throat> and, you know, supposedly an Obi-Wan Kenobi yeah. show. Um, so, you know, which Obi-Wan? You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Or where, yeah, where are will you he be? Yeah. What are you hoping for from the Obi-Wan show? You know, I... I really don't want to see him living on Tatooine. I mean, that is less interesting to me than um, I'd, I'd kind of like to know more about 
when he got to know the Duchess, you know, on, on Mandalore. Um, nice. Agreed. You know, that, that part of his life um, is of interest to me. So, um, you know, we'll see. <clears throat> It'll yeah. be, um, it will be intriguing. And um, to see what they do. I, I would love to help out. <laughs> you know, just just like I would love to help out on Picard, yeah. since you guys seem to think so highly of Measure of a Man. Yeah, you know? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> we would love you. Oh, uh, well, well. Th- this kind of ties into some... I think you, you could only... Well, imagine. that's, yeah, there, there's... Something I brought I've brought up on the podcast quite often is the the binge culture and just how how seasons have truncated into ten or well sometimes even eight to ten to twelve episodes and yeah and there's no like you don't get this humanity and this character development you don't give people time to do these story arcs you have to throw it out at them quickly and there's just um it's almost like there's a lack of heart in a lot of ways because you 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 don't really get these. You know, I want to know kind of like what you're saying about Obi Wan. Like, I want to know more about these char- this character, and how this character and this character connected, and how you know, um, just I want more more about character yeah. relationships and less about action. And boom, boom, yeah. I'm, I mean, don't get me wrong; action sequences are fun, and yeah, like fights are fun. But I'm really I'm more about the cerebral. You know, like I want I want the I want to know what's going on, and I want more more story arc. And you know, I miss those twenty. 30 episode seasons, you know, where you get these season long story arcs. Okay, yeah. Like it, it just, you know, I, I miss that. I miss that in a lot of, a lot of the stuff. And I, that's actually one thing that the expanse is really good at, which is amazing. You know, as you get this, these multiple seasons of this whole story arc between earth and Mars and the belters and all this stuff. And it's just, it just, I love it because <laughs> there's just so much goodness to it. You know, there's so much goodness there. So, um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Well, and I, think what you, I mean, I, I, for for those of us who have, have worked on the twenty two episode yeah. shows, um, and they're kind of killers. I mean, honestly, I, I think the I think the limited ten ten feels like a good number. Mm-hmm. Eight feels a little a little too truncated, sure. but yeah. you can tell you can figure out you know what is the overarching problem that we're going to deal with in this set of stories. Mm-hmm. And then you can wrap it up and you can tell it when you're into 22, mm-hmm. it's very hard to have this. And, and often when most of the networks did not want you to have an overarching plot because they wanted to be able to, you know, send these out in any order. Mm-hmm. they wanted. Yep. There was also, it, it becomes, it's, it's a crushing work schedule. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like laying track for a train that's like 300 feet behind mm-hmm. you. And so often you end up with the inevitable clip show or, Oh my God! What can we do next week? How about if we do "It's a Wonderful Life" again? Anytime you feel that stress is why. Yeah, anytime you feel that stress is why we don't get that anymore. Um, well, ex- expense. Um, I think that oh, yeah, you yeah. know, and viewership has become so fragmented. Also, yeah. the network model is gone. I mean, it's done. Yeah, and everything yeah. is going to be streamers, and. And they're trying to find, you know, what Mad Men proved is that you can have a show that's successful with 900,000 people watching it. Yeah. I work for an ad agency um, and I love, I love, I love Mad Men. <laughs> yeah, yes. But, but it tells you that, I mean, we're slicing and dicing and, and targeting people. I know this is for this art, this demographic, this is, you know, the algorithms are there that tell Mm -hmm. them. And so in some ways, the 22 episodes that have to appeal to 30 million people, that's not the model. That's not the world we're living in anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, and they're probably not going to come back. I mean, you know, there's a generation that loves it. You know, the the CBS viewer are still very happy with, you Mm -hmm. know, the NCSI, (laughs) but that's, that's becoming much, much less um and and binge culture has changed everything it changes how we apply yeah um you have to go in and think about this almost as if it's a novel that has to i have to tie up this story and then there's the next book in the series is the way i try to think about Mm -hmm. it um that each each season builds on itself to the next one um i mean clearly they did that beautifully in the mandalorian Mm -hmm. You, you're like, okay, we're set okay. up. We know what's coming yeah. in the second season, <laughs> you know. Um, and that that's that's powerful. But I think it can be done. It's just 
everybody worries that the viewers will tune out if there's not enough bang, bang, boom, boom. And that's not true. Yeah. I mean, we love Every- fiction because we want people to interact. Absolutely. Um, yeah. We want to experience our world through fictional life. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, I have one final question for you, but uh, I'll let everybody else ask anything. If they I have a quick question. Well, maybe it might not be quick, but um, since you brought it up earlier, Melinda, what was your thoughts on the first season of Picard overall? Um, there was a lot of it that I actually did like. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I thought... It, the direction, art direction was beautiful. Jonathan did a great job on the episodes he directed. You know, great cast, good performances. Uh, structurally, I have issues. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I feel like, you know, I, I, I was like, there were missed opportunities that left me questioning and wondering. And, and I just, the ending baffled me a bit, <laughs> Yeah, I confess. Mm-hmm. Um the last three episodes were just sort of head scratching a bit. Um, and, and also again, don't ask me for an emotional response and then tell me it doesn't matter. Cause you stuck the card in a robot. Bottom. Yeah. I mean, yep. Yes. Yeah. We've, <laughs> I, I didn't want to bring it up, yep. but that is actually the thing I had. Meltdown <laughs> yeah. About. Yes. No, I, I was just like, well, for one thing, you knew it was coming and they'd been telegraphing yeah. it. Back yeah. To, you know, bl- too, too obviously. Hey guys, we have a golem here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we can download personalities. And, you know, but there were just like all of these. I mean, also, I feel very personally about poor Bruce Maddox getting murdered. Yeah. But I yeah. kept of going, yeah. why is he on the Las Vegas planet in the first place? Why isn't he home with his creations? I mean, what? They never explained why he <laughs> left. I mean, I, I was just like, what? Yeah. And then you murdered mm-hmm. him. Um, yeah. So, yep. <laughs> okay. Um, but he, he, yeah, I was very frustrated. And, and that this he was is, a plot device? <laughs> He was, yeah. I mean, well, he was a MacGuffin for the first four episodes, and then they killed Indeed. him. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but I, you know, here was my crazy suggestion when I was being interviewed by somebody, and they thought I was nuts, but I was like, if they had really been courageous, they would have downloaded Picard's personality and cast some fabulous British actor, young British actor, you know, a Tom Hiddleston, a, a, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. And had them take over to be the, new Picard, mm-hmm. be the yes. new Picard. Yeah, that would have been interesting. That would have been quite this a twist, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and then at I least I would have gone, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> well, e- um, even in one of the previous episodes, I was like, wouldn't it be amazing if the Gollum was Tom Hardy and he started yeah. playing Picard because mm-hmm. he played Picard? Yeah, <laughs> and then we were like, Tom, they can't play Tom Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> but wouldn't that be amazing if, like, the guy that played Picard and Nemesis ended up becoming Picard? I, I don't know. It, yeah, just, cool. yeah. <laughs> that is a cool idea. That's yeah, just, I mean, cool, do yeah. something to shake this up. I mean, that would yeah. have been my... And and there were things... What I also did really like is that fact that the universe wasn't as clean and um, and shiny as as the TV shows. Mm-hmm. There, you know, there there was a Romulan pirate. Who was that guy? I, you know, why <laughs> and why was he shooting at them? You know, I wanted. Okay, I have to get. So Rios says a cash gift is always, you know, whatever. Welcome. Yeah. So obviously welcome. they bribed them to get the allow Picard to go down to the planet. I wanted them to have paid the bribe to that Romulan dude. Yeah. And the check bounced. The and the check yeah, the pirate and the check bounced. <laughs> and that's why he's shooting. I mean, oh, you know, because because Rios didn't actually have the credits. Yeah. You know, there wasn't the money. <laughs> and he's shooting at because why? I mean, that would have been fun. Yeah. But I liked yeah. I liked the fact that the world had, you know, black market traders and in, you know, mm-hmm. casino planets and some of and the pirates. crime. Yeah, give me some grime. Yeah. Um, I don't understand why the cute elfin guy uses a sword um, <laughs> when there are phasers, right. but okay. He's a um, space elf. Yeah, he is a space elf. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was it was, you know, again, show looked great. Um, there was and there were some lovely performances. I just I just hope they get a little better sense about what it is they want this show to talk about. Yeah. I guess. Now I I do have a question actually because this. It's almost like they took your episode, Measure of a Man, and developed a series uh, from it. <laughs> so, I mean, do, do you, uh, yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, so good. do you have like a, like a, does that, 
uh, just as the person who wrote, you know, uh, and worked on um, Measure of a Man, like, that's got to feel good. That's got to just feel amazing to, like, to feel like that gem. And and by the way, that was an amazing episode. I mean, that, like, every everyone, yeah. that, that episode is just so real and raw and amazing. And Picard and Riker and just the, the character, um, just the, the conflicts and all. It was just, it's... Mickey it Riker was so just, good, oh my God. so good, Heartbreaking. and I mean, just it's got to feel amazing to like have this gem that is yours that you know essentially became what because it's it's what's what Picard is. So you know the new the new series. So of course, if they had you on it, it would be nothing but amazing because they're already using that mm-hmm. episode. You know, and Maddox, mind you, we all were irritated when Maddox got killed. It was like, why was he even around? Why was he even in this in the show? Um, but I mean, ha- like, how do you feel about that? Just as the person that worked on and wrote, um, measure of a man. Well, I, obviously I was quite flattered to, <laughs> you know, discover that they thought that highly. I mean, it, the weird thing was, is that I had no idea. Um, I, I mean, honestly, I've never watched another episode of Trek after I left the show. It was, it was a difficult mm-hmm. show. And yes. I had no intention of watching Picard um, either, um, except that suddenly I started after the first episode, I started getting all of these messages from fans saying, did you know they're building this show? And I was like, what? <laughs> um, I, I didn't know. I mean, nobody, nobody reached out to me mm-hmm. to say, hey, you know, we're doing this. And that felt that felt, I'll be honest, disrespectful. Yeah, yeah, I can um, imagine. You know, so, you know, while I'm flattered that they thought highly of the work um i and and i was very appreciative when michael chabin um gave that nice shout out on instagram um because women oftentimes women get erased off their own creative work Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. that was how i felt initially because there was no acknowledgement Mm -hmm. of you know where this had come from um, and it was, it was very nice to, to get that acknowledgement from Michael. So, um, and I do think it happens more frequently to women, uh, than it does yeah. to men. That reminds me of, uh, how they changed, um, uh, Lucarno's name to Tom Paris so they wouldn't have to, you know, get yeah. in touch with the person who wrote that episode. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yes. yeah that's not a new thing in the Star Trek world. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, I do like uh, there, there's that strange distinction in Star Trek where the the show itself is all about like the optimism and the future of a world where everybody's treated equally, but then behind the scenes has been notoriously kind of like anti woman. <laughs> uh, yeah, hmm. yes, very much. So, but let's not talk about that, Keith. No, let's not talk about the <laughs> nope. downside. Yeah, my, my my final question would be: um, uh, in the current landscape of science fiction. What recommendations do you currently have right now where you think people are not giving enough credit and you think, guys, you need to check this out, like Three Body Problem? Oh, gosh. Um, wow. Yes, give us your recommendations, please. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. um, I'm a huge fan of Max Gladstone. He's a wonderful writer, um, and I recruited him for Wild Cards because he's so good. Um, obviously, Wild Cards. I think very highly of it, but people should uh, – Message me so I can sort of guide them because at 28 books, it's a little daunting. Let me help you get into the series. Um, and George and I have gotten a lot better about how to edit and manage this unwieldy thing, too, over the years. So um, I, I think the later books are somewhat better than our earlier attempts. Um, cool. Very fond of, I'm trying to, oh, God. I'm, and, and, of course, now I'm just drawing a complete and utter blank. That's embarrassing. Always. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, like, Emma, it, uh, Emma, like video yeah, games. Emma Newman TV is a wonderful or... writer, uh, worth absolutely worth reading. She's a British uh, writer, Emma Newman. Um, video games, you know, I... I'm trying Witcher Three. It's a little tricky. <laughs> the yeah. combat, it, it, the combat. Because I, yeah, I play on a console and it's like, ah, oh yeah, you know. Um, That's why I switched to PC. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I may have to because I'm sort of like, oh my god, I can't, you know. Anyway, um, I, I'm not sure I can recommend on that a TV. What would I say that's been overlooked? The Magicians. Ooh. Please check out The Magicians. It's finished its series. You can you can binge it for five episodes. It's it's amazing. And another show, again, that has concluded, but it's by Jonah Nolan, who's doing Westworld. 
It's one of the finest science fiction shows ever. It's called Person of Interest. Mm. Mm-hmm. It was on CBS yeah. for five, you know, Heard five years or four and a half years. And don't be fooled. For six episodes, you'll think it's just a procedural, and then it turns into a science fiction show, and it gets Ooh, more and more and more. It's all about AI. Okay. Wow. And about oh, I love it. And about creating family, and it is fabulous. And it has some of the most powerful, interesting women characters you will see. Jonah is a treasure. He casts. Well, you're hitting on my buttons. Here. <laughs> oh, you're gonna love it. And it's just it's a. But like I said, don't be fooled. It you're gonna think because it, it was on CBS. And I asked Jonah at a dinner one night, I said, how did you ever get this past West Moon Vest? And he said, I told them it was a procedural. <laughs> <laughs> I just lied. And, uh, but yeah, it's brilliant. Cool. And, and he deliberately casts, he casts women in their 30s and 40s. Um, oh, women who, who have life Thank experience. God. Yeah. And so it's not all 20 year olds, you know. Um, and so it, it's a marvelous show. So I highly recommend that. And then, it's, you know, there's just so much new right now too. I mean, you know, that you just can't, you can't keep up with yeah. it all. I mean, I'm, um, so those are my recommendations. Cool. <laughs> and, Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. And eventually, um, I'll, I got back the rights to a lot of my book series and we're starting mm-hmm. to get them back up. They're not, yes. we're not there yet, but as soon as they are, people can, follow my website or me on Twitter or Facebook and, and I'll be announcing when things are available. So, because I, I just finished book five of the big space opera, nice, you know, nice. which is the final book. Please cool. feel free to let everyone know where to find you like online, you know, your, 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 um, uh, usernames. Yeah, um, okay. I'm, I'm M M M Snodgrass on Twitter. Um, on Facebook, I think I'm just Melinda Snodgrass. And uh, I have a website, Melinda M. Snodgrass. So if you Google me, you'll find me. I, I, and I do Instagram, but badly because <laughs> I'm, I'm a word person, not a picture person. <laughs> I, I'm trying to remember to take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I do want to ask you one last question. Okay. If you could be the head writer on any show, what show would you like? A show that already exists, a show that's based on your work, a show that doesn't exist yet, anything. Well, your obviously, I want to be, I'd love to be the showrunner on my own show <laughs> um, on and mm-hmm. on, on Wild Cards or on my, I written a spec pilot that we were going to try to shoot this summer, except now who knows, um, which is based on my Edge books about the war between science and rationality and superstition and religion. Um, so I'm hoping <laughs> we can still... Do you need still... a, a 30-year-old actress? Because I'm <laughs> Uh, yes, actually. Excellent. I, I have if you to... need somebody to give you coffee, like I, I'm a, I'm a all star at this. I, I can do it for you. <laughs> we need all the people we can get to make this thing Excellent. happen, and then they're going to need content after the plague is over. Mm. So hopefully, you know, we'll be able to sell it. <laughs> um, but uh, obviously, that. And then if I could go to work on any show out there, you know, I would love to work on any of the Star Wars shows they're developing. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, let me go to work on Star Trek or Star Wars. Star that Wars. would make me a very happy human. <laughs> you know? Thank you, Star Wars. <laughs> yes, we're a Star Trek podcast, right. but we do love our sci-fi and our Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. but, you can't love Star Trek and not like and only love Star Trek. That's, oh. that's no you can't. Well, yeah. yeah, and we shouldn't be. So, yeah, we got to stop fighting. The fandom has got to stop Trek fighting. Star Trek Star Wars thing. I never shit. understood that. Love never Bones understood it. I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> stop, people. Stop. Uh, well. Yeah, fandoms get along. Yes. Always. Yes. Uh, that's that's all for me. Do you guys have any more questions for Melinda? No, I'm good. I Thank you good. so much. And yeah, honored. Thank yeah, thank you so much for joining oh, yeah. us today. Uh, I'm gonna look you up for that copy date in the future because we, we will. Sabrina, you better let me yeah. know. You know, I'll we'll drive down. You. Six hours is nothing. Yeah, we, <laughs> we don't have time to talk about it today, but I want to talk to you about the difference between AI in fiction and in nonfiction. So. Okay, we, we, it's a it's a coffee date with all and any who could make it. We'll have fun when when yeah, we can yeah. finally get together <laughs> again. You know? That's gonna take like two That'd hours. That'd be amazing. All Yes. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank uh, you. It really, I had a great time. Thank you. <laughs>